Hi, this is Brett Hickey from Star Mountain Capital. I'm the founder and CEO. Excited to be here today with Tom Michaud, CEO of KBW. Tom, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, today, we're going to walk through some information and really focus on opportunities for commercial banks as we think about the market downturn. And as we all know, with challenges come opportunities. And Tom being a professional covering and advising and working with many leading and growing commercial banks across the country for nearly 35 years now. Uh, we're excited to pick his brain and share some of the insights and experiences uh, with you today. Uh, quick background on myself, uh, Star Mountain Capital, we're a lower middle market asset manager. We focus exclusively on US businesses we have three complementary investment verticals that we invest into companies that generally have between 3 million and 20 million EBITDA. One is by making flexible capital solution loans. Two is structured and controlled private equity investments. And three is we have a secondary fund business where we will purchase limited partnership interests and direct assets from other investors in lower middle market credit and equity funds. In the aggregate, our portfolio today, directly and indirectly, is approximately 400 businesses providing us a lot with a lot of data, insights, and information on the U.S. lower middle market, as well as working with dozens of banks across the U.S. Uh, Tom, love to hear a little bit more. You've had a fantastic and quite, an, quite a unique career, unique in the sense that you've spent nearly 35 years at one company. Um, from, I guess you could almost call it like mail room through to CEO. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us about what KBW has become today uh, through its merger also with Stiefel. Sure thing. So when I uh, joined KBW, Keith Broughton Woods in 1986, we were a 75 person firm with a, with a very keen specialty for investment banking on the banking industry. And really, I've grown as the firm has grown over the last 34 years. Um, over the years, uh, our firm broadened out and we built a, a specialty practice across all of FIG uh, to the point where we're also specialists on the insurance sector and also on the fintech and specialty finance sector. So today, we, we manage an investment banking franchise that covers all of financial services. We do it in the North America market. We do it in Europe. And we have a small footprint in Asia. And uh, interestingly, when you look at the financial services industry, it makes one of the biggest percentages to operating earnings in the world stock market still. Even after all the financial damage that happened after the global financial crisis, it still is, is a very vibrant and very large sector. And today, our firm focuses on that. We're 58 years old. Uh, seven years ago, I led a merger with the company into Stiefel Financial, who is our parent company. Uh, Stiefel has about a $4 billion market cap, and we're the sixth largest retail sales force in America, and we have a full service institutional investment banking capability. That's great, and, and great point and reminder for everybody, just the, the real reach and the size of the financial services economy. I remember about 20 years ago when I moved from Canada to New York, as we were talking about a little bit with some of our uh, shared histories a little bit where um, I started working at Solomon's with Barney covering financial institutions and that was a big reason why I started it. I felt that I knew very little about almost anything and so if you can kind of get your arms around the financial institution space, it really touches and, such, and is such a critical part of our entire economy which is a, a, you know, really a great place to develop a career on that. Uh, well, congratulations on, on the great success with your firm. I know having done business uh, with your team, with Ken and Al and other folks, uh, really top-notch reputation team and, and quite incredible, um, your background obviously being there for that long, but also the continuity and the culture that your firm really exemplifies with you in a leadership role is, uh, is quite admirable. Thank you. A little bit more on Star Mountain Capital. Um, as I mentioned before, we manage just over $1.2 billion. We're a 100% employee-owned firm. Uh, we have been investing in the U.S. lower middle market as a team for over 20 years now. And uh, historically, market downturns have really created great opportunities for us as a business, as well as for different bank partnerships. I think many of them 
can really be forged in opportunities uh, like this. So we're, we're certainly excited for this current uh, market downturn. Uh, aside from challenges for people, I, I should say, of course. One of the things we want to tell banks about today is the SBSC program. The SBSC program has been around since 1958. It's not a new program. It was designed to help businesses grow and create jobs across America, given the U.S. lower middle market represents about 50% of the U.S. economy and approximately 90% of employment across the country. So it's a critical part of our economy. The U.S. government set up this program under the Small Business Administration, focused on encouraging private investors to invest with private fund managers to help deploy capital into growing high quality smaller businesses across the country that generally have under 500 employees each. And the government provides low cost financing to help motivate, encourage people. And they also created an exemption for the Volcker rule, which allows banks to not only be able to participate in alternative private equity style potential returns and investments, but it also provides them with CRA credits and various other benefits uh, for banks. Um, the program has provided, as you can see here, uh, nearly $100 billion of capital to over 180 small and medium-sized businesses across the country. So it's really a substantial program. Um, and flipping into one of the financial benefits of it right now is low costs. As we know, the 10-year treasury rate, which the program is modeled off of, allows banks and other private investors to access 10-year fixed rate interest-only money from the U.S. government. The most recent interest rate pricing of this was 2.08% fixed for a decade. Um, so something that's quite a compelling program that we have invested in, I've personally invested in, and it's done uh, very well for us and something that uh, we know that some of your bank clients are familiar with, Tom, but many are less familiar with it. And so it's something that's a great opportunity for banks to think about not only returns, CRA opportunities, but also opportunities to deepen relationships, which I know is a key thing that um, you focus on in advising your clients and saying, during market downturns like this, how can banks really capitalize both organically and strategically on growing their businesses, including forging deeper relationships with managers into this space to create one-to-many relationships with managers. So with that, um, let's, let's switch into in person here, Tom. Um, share some of your tips and wisdom. If you're speaking to banks, what are some of the things you talk to them about in an economy like this? Where are their opportunities? How can they think about growing? As we've all heard the old adage of challenges create opportunities. Um, give us some of your experiences from the last 35 years. Sure. I think the first thing is Clients never forget who has been helpful, especially at, helpful at a time of great need. And what I thought was very interesting over the last several weeks as the country has been dealing with this global pandemic is how small banks around the country and mid-sized banks have really stepped up uh, with many of the programs that have been benefiting mid and smaller sized companies. For example, the payroll protection program was led by the regional and community banks across the country. And I very often have spoken to bank CEOs and they've told me it's been their $20 billion bank that was the number one provider of these types of loans in their state. And I also received a bunch of phone calls from friends of mine who ran these small businesses who said, I can't get a hold of my bank, who can help me? And sure enough, uh, that was, I think, a, a key moment. So my recommendation is always add value to your clients and stay close to your clients at a time like this. And they'll never forget, uh, they'll never forget that you've done that. So that's a great market share opportunity. That's number one. However, the other thing with this particular moment in time and crisis is that I think it's going to accelerate many of the trends that were in place before COVID took over and before the economic shutdown. And as you mentioned earlier, I've been doing this for almost 35 years. Uh, I've never really seen the big banks 
picking up market share at the speed at which they have been coming into this COVID crisis. And I think what was happening is it was forcing the rest of the industry to really focus on what was going to be their core business. And so we've been watching a lot of the mid-sized banks get a little bit more targeted in what it is that they want to do for their clients to make sure that they can compete with the bigger banks who appeared to have a great deal of momentum. So I think customer service and being focused on the type of bank that you want to be and on the types of, of, of businesses where you think you can have a niche and, and a particular heightened degree of focus. That's great. Yeah, we, we've certainly observed that the banks that step up when you have you know, challenges and opportunities, that's, this is really a market opportunity where you can distinguish yourself and, and then really forge those long-term lasting relationships because when times are smooth and even, it's much harder for banks to really differentiate themselves and be responsive and active. And we certainly saw that with the PPP program. Yeah, my opinion is that the bigger the bank, the less likely it is they're gonna customize credit for you. That's my opinion. It's more likely that you're going to kind of fit into a box of the types of things they're going to do. But if you need to have some customization done for the services that you need, you're much more likely, in my opinion, to get that from a regional or community bank than you are from, from the nation's biggest banks. That's helpful. What about other, other aspects? Uh, you guys are very active and, and one of the leaders in doing M&A for banks, helping them grow strategically. Uh, this is a very low rate environment and the, the markets are, are reasonably hot still. Where does that create other opportunities for banks to think strategically outside of client service or in addition to client service? There are a couple of, I think, really important things going on. The first is the recapitalization that's happening of the industry. Uh, as you know, the primary components of capital in the banking industry are tier one capital and tier two capital. And instruments such as common equity, debt, sub-debt, and preferred all fit in different areas of the capital stack. We are watching right now a record pace of sub-debt issuance in the banking industry. Hmm. And, it, and, and the banks are taking advantage of very low rates, a global thirst for yield, and a moment in time to fortify their total capital ratios. Now, when you look at common equity, going into this crisis, the banking industry had an 80-year high of common equity, and that's one of the areas where I would give a high rating to the regulators for encouraging high levels of capitalization post-global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So the industry was in much better shape than it had been prior to other downturns coming in. But the industry right now is taking advantage of this capital raise opportunity and also preferred stock. We've seen uh, a significant pickup in preferred stock issuance. And the banks who are issuing this capital, they're telling us that number one is it would be a great insurance policy in case things did turn for the worse. Or number two is they feel as if they can still put it to good use for their shareholders, even if that didn't happen. So that, 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 that is, I think, the key component of here and now. Mm -hmm. The other item you mentioned about consolidation is that the environment when we come out of this is more likely than not going to have a lower for longer interest rate structure. There's also talk about yield curve management being done by the Fed to control rates even beyond short term rates. Mm -hmm. If that happens, we believe that's going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on banks that are solely spread lenders. And so we think there's going to be a greater degree of interest of building non-interest income revenue sources in the banking industry. So uh, we have probably sold more non-banks to banks in the last 24 months than we had in any other prior 24 month period. And that was even before I think it became as acute as it is now. So that trend was already underway, and we think we'll see banks focusing even more on that. Would that be asset management as an example of something that uh, banks are picking up further? That, that is it, but I would almost liken it to maybe a little bit more along the lines of specialty finance, niche specialty mm -hmm. finance categories. 
either it's a unique way of using technology to gather deposits or possibly it's a very specific lending niche that while it is still net interest income generating, it, it, it falls into the non-traditional banking source. It's still bankable assets, but it's falling into a different niche for an under, underserved community. It could be loans to hospitals. It could be loans mm -hmm. for medical equipment. There are many of these specialty finance companies that have developed these lines that are now, they themselves are interested in marrying with banks so they could have access to deposits. And I guess that's both uh, opportunistic for them as ways to grow, but also defensive in the sense that it is diversifying their portfolio and diversifying their assets away from, I know a lot of banks are pretty heavy into real estate, which can become quite cyclical. So how do they further diversify their portfolio base? Correct. It's a nice marriage from both sides. It could be a successful lending platform that's really looking for more stable deposits. Mm -hmm. And it could be for a bank that's looking to do something that's a little bit less traditional, offers a little bit better spread alternative and diversifies their business or gives them gain on sale opportunity because these types of assets, because of their yield, can quite often be uh, e easily marketable for a gain. That's interesting. So banks you know, can access capital at good rates and there's a bunch of different things they can strategically do with that capital, including different types of business units they could build, generate some good income, as well as potentially generate some long-term capital gain uh, appreciation off those assets if they do it right. Correct. Correct. Right. That's right. Tom, uh, any, any, other, uh, any other kind of tips? Speaking of all the other banks out there, we know people are, are busy right now with different things, um, but any other things you think about when people are busy? Is this a great time for people to lean in? We talked about great time to build relationships. Any other last uh, thoughts? Well, I'll tell you. I'd like to tell you what I hope is the story of this crisis, which is uh, in mid-March, we started heading towards the economic shutdown. March 23rd was the bottom for the Keefe Bank Index or the Keefe Regional Bank Index. Mm -hmm. Since that time, it's been interesting to see what's been happening. Um, while we're still in a recession and times are certainly troubling and are troubled, maybe is a better word, mm -hmm. it does appear that the worst case is being taken off the table. We do see data that shows continuing improvement in the economy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really, it, I think with the worst case being taken off the, the table, it's going to allow businesses to get back to doing offensive things as this plays out longer and as the economy picks up. Unfortunately, there's been a tremendous amount of economic and personal damage. And I'm sure that, the, and there will still be pockets of great concern, whether it's hotels and hotel lending, uh, for example. But overall, we see spending getting better. We see commodity prices getting better. We see more and more data that suggests that we're getting farther away from the worst case. And, and, and so that makes me more optimistic. And you can see it in the bank stocks. Uh, the typical regional bank was trading at 160 of tangible book value on about February 23rd before this really started, it mm -hmm. bottomed at 90% of tangible book value on March 23rd. Now we're around 110, 115. We still have even further to go to recapture what was lost since the beginning. But the nice thing is that we've bounced, I think, in a very, very uh, regular way off of the bottom. That's great. Yeah, and a good point for even people looking at bank stocks could be could be some real opportunities with the right banks that are looking to strategically grow and create some value in this downturn, both, or, both organically as well as strategically. Tom, uh, thank you very much and to the entire team at uh, KBW and Stiefel. Um, we know we've, we've worked with your team before and you guys do great work. So thank you for that. Appreciate that. And thanks for all the time uh, today. Terrific. And thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it greatly and all the best of luck to you and all the good work that you do. Great. Thanks, Ken.